And we'll talk a little bit about why we would see Japanese debris there more than debris from McDonald's. And here is what we're starting to see now more of large identifiable chunks of trash. This is from outside the convergence zone, outside the garbage patch, and yet we've got this floating plastic sheath for a knife, a, a bit of a toothbrush, and a, a handle there for a bucket. Here you can see another toothbrush and a, a bottle cap and the neck of a bottle, and it's broken right there where the neck starts to expand. What we find a lot is thicker pieces of plastic retain their shape longer than thinner pieces, which tend to break down into these little fragments. Here we can see the, uh, there's a lot of plankton mixed in with the sample. The purple color you see would be amphipods and copepods, these little animal plankton. We call zooplankton the zoo, Z-O-O, -O, meaning animal, uh, because they feed on the plant plankton, the phytoplankton. And so the phytoplankton in general are smaller, produced every day by photosynthesis, and the zooplankton consume them uh, and the zooplankton then are eaten by the larger organisms like fish. <coughs> Here you can see uh, some button bolella. These are kind of jellyfish that are about the size of a button, along with bits of plastic. Here you see more uh, plastic and plankton together. As I said, our original study found a ratio of 6 to 1 plastic to plankton. I would say this is a bit more than that. Uh, here's another one with a little bit different color plankton. Here's one with uh, a bottle cap that's already broken. This is fishing line wadded up here. And just the reason I'm showing you more and more and more of these things and not letting you off the hook is that this is what we have to look at. This is what we have to see day after day after day trawling this net out there going thousands of miles from land we are impressed by the fact that we can't get away from this stuff. We're not finding a true edge or a place where this stuff is. We're finding no places free from this type of pollution. Um, this is an oyster spacer from the oyster industry that uh, spaces out between oysters. Um, here you see a bottle cap and some Bolilla bolilla. These are jellyfish that actually have a sail. These little uh, blue ovals um, sail around the ocean with a sail that sticks up above the surface of the water, catches the wind, and allows them to proliferate. More stuff. Another oyster space. Oh, popsicle stick. Oh, this is great. You know, we used to make popsicle sticks out of wood. We never find any little bits of wood in our samples because wood is biodegradable. It would have already gone by the time it got from land to thousands of miles out in the deep ocean. Uh, this stuff's only traveling around 10 miles a day, and it takes a long time for it to get a thousand miles out in the ocean. And these popsicle sticks, if they were made out of wood, they'd be long gone, but because they're made out of plastic now, they persist and we see them in our samples. Uh, this is another one outside the so-called convergent zone, outside the uh, garbage patch, but one of the worst ones I've ever seen. Uh, just incredible, very little plankton and just a tremendous amount of plastic fragments. So, what I'm showing you, this is the last one of these, this series, is a night trawl. And what happens at night is there's this largest daily migration of life on Earth comes to the surface at night uh, out in the deep ocean. And the reason is because that's where the food is. But they have to hide during the day or they'd be eaten by the predators out there. Most of the ocean is what we call deep hopper. It's really not full of fish. It's not really full of anything. If we dive over the side and look, a lot of times we'll see bits of plastic floating by and then maybe a piece of plankton. But widely spaced apart, there's big bodies of water out in the ocean that are called oligotrophic, they're oceanic deserts. But at night, that, that, what, what happens during the day is 
the, the, the nutrients that are there, which are sparse, uh, and the impact of sunlight on the water creates photosynthesis and plant life blossoms during the day. But it's not enough to really create a meadow, you know. I mean, occasionally there are blooms that exceed the ability of the uh, zooplankton and the fish to eat it. But for the most part, just about everything that's produced in terms of uh, basic food through photosynthesis during the day is consumed every night. And these are one of the predators that's consuming it, these lantern fish that are in this sample. Now, I'm going to uh, go ahead and play a, a professionally done piece by ABC, the Nightline people. And the reason I'm going to do that is because they are better at it than I am explaining this whole phenomenon. And they're going to say in there that they, they couldn't really figure out why or how I was able to do this kind of research. So they just assume I'm an independently wealthy guy that had a kind of a crazy idea about sampling the ocean. but. As a matter of fact, just about everything I had from my business, I sank into making this boat, and I'm now on the verge of being less independent and much less wealthy. So take that with a grain of salt, but here it is, the nightline.